think uh, we can go ahead and get started. So here's a quick reminder of uh, the concepts that we covered in the, the past two lectures. Uh, so the main, uh, I guess, ideas, set of ideas we've been covering in the, the past two lectures uh, has to do with motion planning. And specifically, we've been looking at motion planning in discrete spaces. So, so far on this kind of module on, on motion planning, we've covered four different algorithms. Uh, and these are all graph search algorithms. So specifically, we looked at uh, BFS, so breadth per search, and DFS, uh, depth per search, uh, search two lectures ago. Uh, and these were algorithms that gave us feasible uh, motion plans. So by feasible, I mean uh, it gets you from uh, point A to point B uh, without colliding with, uh, with obstacles. Uh, and then in the, the previous lecture, uh, we described two additional algorithms. Uh, so the first one was uh, Dijkstra's algorithm. And then the second one was the uh, A star algorithm. And these are algorithms that give you optimal motion plans. Uh, so you define some notion of optimality, so some cost function, uh, and these algorithms will give you uh, both feasibility and optimality, so some way to get from the start to the end without colliding with obstacles, uh, but also uh, the optimal way, however you define optimal, um, it'll give you some, some optimal uh, path. Um, so I guess these are extremely powerful, uh, and hopefully you kind of see uh, the, the power of of some of these algorithms using some of the examples that we uh, saw in the previous lectures. Um, but they have some pretty important uh, pitfalls, uh, pretty important uh, shortcomings. Uh, and the main one is, is this assumption that everything is discrete. Uh, so really, if we're thinking about motion planning for, a, for an actual robotic system like a drone, uh, we're operating in a space that's inherently continuous. It's not discrete. So for a continuous planning problem, Uh, we need to discretize our space somehow. Um, so I guess does anyone see what the issue with this might be? So if you're trying to do discretization uh, for a drone, let's say, uh, what's, the, what's the problem, right? So in principle, you could discretize and apply these algorithms, but uh, what's the, the challenge? For, for higher dimensional systems, if we discretize, we have an exponentially scalable Yep, exactly right. So, so there's this uh, term called the curse of dimensionality. Uh, and that's exactly what you said. So imagine that you have uh, some d-dimensional space. That you're discretizing. Uh, and imagine that you discretize each axis, so each dimension of that space, with b bins, uh, so b like points uh, along each uh, axis. Uh, what you're going to end up with is b uh, to the d, uh, so b raised to d uh, points, right, in your uh, graph storage problem. Uh, and this is exponential in the, uh, the dimension. Uh, so at least with this kind of naive discretization scheme where you just discretize each dimension. Uh, with, uh, with B like points. Um, so if you're taking a two-dimensional space, uh, then it's B squared. Three-dimensional space is going to be B cubed, and, and so on. Um, so if you have even a moderately high dimensional uh, continuous uh, planning problem, uh, then the number of vertices in your graph search problem uh, gets extremely, extremely large. Uh, and I guess at some point, these numbers get just silly, uh, like larger than the number of atoms in the observable universe, and, and so on. So yeah, this is the, the main challenge, this like, curse of dimensionality. Um, and actually, the, the problem is even worse than it, it might initially appear. Uh, so you might say, OK, what's the big deal? Uh, we don't really care about particularly high values of d, right? So my drone lives in, in the real world. My real world is three-dimensional. Um, 
So yeah, I guess why do I care if it's uh, larger, or, or why do I care if it scales poorly uh, for, uh, for large uh, D? Um, so yeah, I guess to, to see exactly why uh, this cursor dimensionality challenge is, is so bad, uh, even for a system like a drone that's operating, at least kind of nominally, seems like operating uh, in, in a three-dimensional uh, environment, um, the reason it gets challenging is when we start thinking about the, the geometry of the robot. So, so far in both lectures, uh, we've kind of made this assumption that the robot is a point. So it has no physical extent, right? Uh, that's the, the assumption we made in the, the previous two lectures when we were discussing graph search and, and digitalization and so on. Uh, so things get much more interesting when you start uh, taking into account the, uh, the geometry of the, the robot itself. Uh, so in reality, of course, your robot has some non-trivial Uh, shape. Uh, so it's obviously not a point, it may not be a sphere, it might uh, just have some uh, kind of complex uh, geometry. Um, so just as an example, which is going to help uh, motivate some of these concepts. So imagine that your robot is operating in this uh, room. Uh, so this is some bounded uh, environment. Uh, and there are three obstacles in the, the environment. So they look like this. Um, and imagine the starting point for your robot is over here. Uh, and the goal is over here. Uh, and suppose that the, the robot uh, is a rectangle. So this is not a particularly complicated shape, but um, yeah, it turns out even this is like pretty challenging. So this is your robot. Um, so the robot can translate uh, and also uh, potentially rotate to change its uh, orientation. Uh, so this has three degrees of freedom. Right, the two, two uh, translational degrees of freedom uh, corresponding to the center of mass location, let's say, and the rotational uh, degree of freedom, the, the orientation of the, the robot. Um, so yeah, I guess let's think about how uh, the robot might uh, plan uh, to go from the starting uh, configuration, let's say it's like this, to the ending configuration, which is with the center of mass, let's say at point P, and then the orientation actually doesn't matter. Uh, let's just say it wants to get to the, uh, that point B with zero uh, orientation. Uh, so how would we go about uh, doing this? So here's a simple idea. <coughs> that uh, sometimes works, but actually in this case uh, doesn't work. Uh, but it's nevertheless uh, kind of instructive to, to think about this, uh, this simple idea. Uh, so the simple idea is just approximate your robot. with a circle. More generally, this would be a, a sphere. Uh, since we're working just in, in 2D, uh, just imagine that you take your robot, uh, and you just approximate it with the smallest uh, circle that encloses the, uh, the shape of the robot. Uh, and let's give the radius of that circle a, a name. Uh, let's call it R. Um, so what does this allow you to do? So basically what we can do is we can uh, inflate the obstacles. Uh, by some like margin, uh, which is equal to, to R. 
so what I mean is, let's say you have, let's just look at one obstacle. So one of these rectangular uh, shapes over here. So each of these is an obstacle. So what you can do is take this uh, rectangular optical shape uh, and just make it larger. Uh, so at every point here, uh, you could kind of extend it by uh, a margin capital R. And so what you'll get is something that looks kind of like this. And you can think of this uh, inflated obstacle now uh, as an obstacle uh, for a point robot, right? Um, so we could say we're not going to think about the uh, robot being a robot having some kind of extent. Uh, we're going to instead think of the robot corresponding to a point, uh, but then the obstacles are now inflated uh, by a, a, a size of, uh, of R. Um, so yeah, I guess what's the, the problem with this? So the, okay, what's the advantage first? So the advantage is we're back to the setting of point robot, which is something that, uh, in principle, we can handle. That's the assumption we've made so far. Everything is, uh, uh, all, all the, our kind of, uh, uh, the geometry of the robot is, is just a point. Um, so that, that's the advantage. But yeah, the disadvantage, of course, is we've made things infeasible. Right? So the motion planning problem here uh, that I've drawn out over here is actually feasible. Um, so the robot can kind of go like this and then uh, have a horizontal orientation uh, squeeze through the gap and then get to the, the goal. Uh, but if we inflate uh, each of these obstacles by uh, a radius r, so let's say this was one of the obstacles, let's say this is another obstacle over here. So if we inflate this one as well, we're going to get something like this. And then uh, I guess there's a third obstacle somewhere over here. So we inflate that. Uh, so now we just end up with a wall, right? Uh, so the, there's no way uh, for a point robot uh, to get from this point A to, uh, to this point uh, B. All right, so yeah, this is an idea. Actually, let me make sure, I guess, that the, the idea is clear. Uh, any questions on, on what we did? So in this case, it doesn't work, uh, like the way I've drawn the, the picture. Uh, but actually, it turns out that this is a pretty powerful and like popular, uh, like pretty widely used idea. Uh, and it's something that you'll use in the next lab uh, when we do motion planning uh, for the, the crazy fly uh, robot. Um, this can work if the obstacles are kind of relatively uh, well separated. Um, but if you have obstacles that are close together, uh, then you really need to think about the, the actual like, shape of the robot uh, to solve the, the motion planning uh, problem. Okay. So, all right, so here's, a, I guess, a better idea, a much more uh, important idea. Uh, so this is the idea of a configuration space. <coughs> so the configuration space it's pretty much what it sounds like. So it's the, the space corresponding to uh, configurations of the robot. So in this example, uh, with this three degree of freedom uh, system, the configuration space uh, corresponds to all points uh, x, y, theta. Uh, right, so any particular x, y, and theta, so x and y is the, the center of mass location of the robot, theta is the orientation. 
Uh, so any particular x, y, and theta uh, specifies a particular configuration of the robot. Uh, the configuration space is just a space of all these uh, tuples, uh, x, y, uh, theta. Um, so, all right, so I guess one just note here um, is that C, so C is the configuration space. Um, for, yeah, let's say, let's say in this example, uh, C is not the same as R3. Uh, so it's not the same as Euclidean, like the three-dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, I guess it's saying on CY, like what is the, the main difference? Go ahead. There can be different constraints on each of the uh, different dimensions. So for example, data is, of course, not, um, data is an equal Yes, yeah, exactly. So, so theta here is what makes things, uh, what makes the configuration space not the same as the Euclidean space. Uh, so the topology of this space is not uh, the same as R3, uh, so specifically, uh, the angle wraps, right? So zero orientation uh, is the same as two pi. So the angle keeps increasing, the orientation keeps changing. Uh, at some point, the robot is back uh, to its original <coughs> orientation. Um, and that, of course, would not happen uh, if you're just moving in three-dimensional uh, Euclidean space. So yeah, I guess this is just to make the point that the configuration space uh, is interesting, like already. We haven't thought about obstacles yet. We're just uh, assigning. Um, or we're just uh, defining the, the space of all possible uh, configurations uh, that your robot could, uh, could be in. So let's take into account obstacles next. Any questions on the definition so far of the configuration space? OK. So yeah, let's think about how obstacles fit into the configuration space. So let's define uh, a set that we're going to call C subscript ops, OBS uh, for obstacles. So this is the set uh, of x, y, theta uh, such that uh, the robot in configuration uh, x, y, theta uh, is in collision with some obstacle. So if I visualize the configuration space like this, so let's say this is x, this is y, this is theta. Um, so each point here um, corresponds to a particular configuration of the, the robot. So let's say this is the, the robot. Um, we can check whether this configuration results in a collision or not uh, with the obstacles. So we have these three uh, obstacles over here. Uh, so for every point here in the configuration space, we can kind of visualize like where is the robot. We can ask, uh, is there a collision or not? Uh, and this set, uh, C obs, uh, is the set of all configurations where the robot is in collision with some obstacle. So C obs is a subset. Uh, in general, of uh, C, the configuration space. All right, questions on? Yes, question. You drew a frame of reference there. Is x, y supposed to represent the position of the center of mass and theta the orientation? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so what I'm kind of visualizing here is the configuration space. And it's exactly what you said. So x, y, uh, these, axes, these uh, directions correspond to the center of mass location of the robot. Theta is the, the orientation. Uh, so every point in this three-dimensional space 
um, has a, a kind of instantiation in terms of a like physical like configuration of the robot, uh, and then we're defining this uh, subset, which is all the configurations um, th uh, that result in a collision with an obstacle. Good. Other questions? Okay. So we're going to visualize uh, like what these obstacle sets look like in configuration space, and it turns out maybe you can kind of roughly like intuit this. Uh, they look very complicated uh, in configuration space, even in these kind of relatively simple uh, two-dimensional uh, examples. Um, but okay, but I guess what's the the advantage uh, of of uh, thinking about things this way? Um, so we've again reduced our problem of doing motion planning while thinking about the, um, the extent of the, the robot, the geometry of the robot. Uh, we've reduced that problem uh, into planning uh, for a point robot. Um, so the idea is to find a motion plan or find a path uh, for a point robot. Let's just say a point, actually. Um, in configuration space, uh, such that Uh, the path avoids uh, C paths. Right, so let's say this is the configuration space, there's some like C obs. It's not going to look like this, I'll show you exactly what it looks like uh, in, a, in a little bit on the, the slides. Uh, but yeah, just imagine some subset uh, where the robot uh, is going to be in collision if it's in any of these configurations. Uh, the robot is in some starting configuration, which we can call A. Uh, the robot wants to get to some goal configuration, which we can call B. Um, and now this is just a motion planning problem for a point, right? We just want to find uh, some path now in configuration space that avoids the, uh, the obstacles, um, or that avoids uh, C obs, uh, like the, the set of configurations uh, that results in, uh, in a collision with, a, with an obstacle. So yeah, this is a really important idea, maybe slightly subtle. Uh, so I want to just pause for a second, see if there are questions. Uh, go ahead. I think before you mentioned that like orientation, for example, would it matter for the goal state? Yeah. So uh, could you, do we sometimes represent the as a set? Yes. Set? Yeah, good. So the, um, the kind of like more general version of the, the planning problem uh, has the goal uh, not necessarily being a point, but you could say uh, the goal is a, a set. Uh, and actually, maybe just as an exercise, uh, so in that example, which I raised now, uh, where I said that the orientation doesn't matter, uh, what would that set look like in, in configuration space? Go ahead. A line. A line, yeah. So um, a line that uh, goes through the goal x, y, uh, and it's kind of like vertical, right? So any theta is allowed. So that's, yeah, that's exactly what it is. OK, good. Other questions on this idea of configuration space and why or how we've reduced the problem of thinking about the geometry of the robot uh, to now just thinking about uh, planning uh, for a point? Yes? I think um, one of the things we assumed early on for motion planning is that the robot kind of like has knowledge of the environment. Yes. So CIOBS that knowledge. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So CIOBS uh, is. <laughs> Is that knowledge, or you could say, like the obstacle locations are, are like given to us, and then, like in principle, we could construct uh, C obs uh, given the, the knowledge of exactly where the obstacles are. Yeah, so far we're still assuming that we know uh, what the uh, the obstacle locations are. All right. So in principle, we could just discretize, right? So we can just discretize our configuration space now.
and then like apply graph search algorithms, like a star or whatever, Dijkstra, uh, any of the, the other algorithms. Um, but this is, is challenging, uh, challenging to do in, in practice. Um, and yeah, there's basically kind of two main challenges that I want to highlight. So yeah, conceptually things are nice, uh, like the, the picture is nice, uh, but to actually like implement uh, what I said over there in practice, like discretize your configuration space and apply graph search algorithms, uh, that has like two pretty serious uh, challenges. Uh, so the first one is that uh, the configuration space can be high dimensional. So potentially like very like high dimensional. So even though the kind of ambient space that your robot is operating in is three dimensional or two dimensional in, in the examples that I'm drawing here, uh, the configuration space configuration space uh, can be much higher dimensional. So imagine like an n-link arm, so a, a robot with uh, and uh, links. Uh, so I've drawn, yeah, I guess one, two, three, four, five uh, links. Uh, and there's some obstacles here. Um, so the motion planning problem is uh, like to get the robot from, let's say, this initial configuration uh, to some final configuration. Like maybe there's some object here that the, the arm wants to grasp, so you can try to kind of squeeze the arm like through uh, the gap between the obstacles uh, to grasp that, uh, uh, that object over there. Um, so yeah, I guess what's the configuration space dimension for this example? Go ahead. Like uh, S N, <laughs> like some. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Exactly. Right. So S, maybe with the uh, bold N, uh, S N. So S is the uh, circle, uh, and you have like N uh, copies of it. Uh, so the circle, uh, because we're looking at angles. Um, so each uh, joint here, uh, you can uh, that corresponds to one degree of freedom. Uh, each like joint angle uh, like goes from zero to, to two pi, so it's a circle, um, and then uh, yeah, each every joint is a is a separate uh, degree of freedom. Uh, so you have like n uh, copies. Uh, question is, could you uh, reduce the dimensionality by thinking of it as just one um, one point with multiple angles from which you can extrapolate? Because you have a fixed distance for each one, so you don't actually have to know x y if you, uh, for each one. You know, like, oh, I. I see. So sorry. Yeah, maybe my uh, maybe the confusion was because I, I didn't describe the, the setup clearly. Uh, so here, uh, by n-link arm, I mean you can control uh, each joint uh, separately. Right, but um, the the distance is still the same. So as long as you know the angle, you don't actually have to know uh, another two dimensions for for uh, disambiguating like the, the position. Um, like the, the the distance is fixed. So if you have an angle from from one link to the next link. Yes, uh, but I guess you still need the, the n angles to, to specify, right? Uh, uh, right, so it wouldn't be exponential with that. Would be oh, yes, yes, yes. So it's not uh, exponential. Uh, so by Sn, what I mean is, um, so it would be like Rn uh, if you were looking at uh, like variables that were like translational. Uh, so S is, by S I mean like the, the circle. 
so we have like five or how many ever like n copies of the uh, the circle. Um, so it's I guess another way to, to write it is so we have zero to two pi cross zero to two pi. Um, and we have yeah n n copies of this. So th that that's all I meant here. Yeah, I guess is, is this here questions on, on this? Yeah, good. Sorry, it's just about the s n thing. So yeah. Like geometrically, like would you like would s so one just be a circle and then like s two would be like a sphere or like s three would be a sphere? I guess? So it's not or quite or like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, it turns out it's it's uh, yeah it's it's not it's not that yeah. those are like not exactly the the same shapes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and these things are kind of like hard to uh, to visualize. I think the the easiest thing might just be to, to think about this. You just take zero to, to two pi, uh, and then you have a, a Cartesian product, uh, like a set product, uh, n times. Okay. Yeah, I guess the the point here is that just this can be pretty high dimensional, right? So uh, if you have a seven link arm, then the configuration space has uh, dimension seven uh, in general, uh, n uh, dimensions for an n link arm. So that, that's the, the first challenge. So if you want to discretize uh, this space, uh, now uh, you have uh, this cursor dimensionality. So the number of points in your uh, discretized problem, in your graph search problem, uh, is going to be exponential in the dimension of the configuration space. Um, and yeah, you're going to have some like gigantic like graph search problem that's not going to be feasible to, to solve in, in practice. Uh, and the second challenge is that constructing Or even representing, like computationally representing, uh, the set C ops, the uh, the subset of configurations in your configuration space that are uh, that result in a collision, uh, can be extremely challenging. Like it's not even clear uh, what kind of representation you should use uh, to uh, describe uh, C odds. Uh, and yeah, the, the reason is that this set uh, C odds uh, can be pretty pretty complicated. Uh, and I'm going to show you some pretty cool uh, visualizations of this. So yeah, I guess just to just to set this up. Um, so that's the, the robot up there. So it's really just a, a triangle. Uh, so again, a three degree of freedom system. Uh, so I was drawing a rectangle. Uh, yeah, just uh, switch that to your, in your head to a, to a triangle. Uh, it's the same setup. So x, y is the uh, kind of center, uh, centroid location. So that's the, the black dot on the triangle. Uh, theta is the, the orientation. Uh, so initially, this is just going to visualize the configuration space, so no obstacles, and then of rotations, the vertical direction can either be... Sorry, I want to not have the audio. Okay, there it is. All right. um, yeah, so that's showing the physical configuration. That's showing, on the left, is showing the, uh, the point in the, the configuration space, or points in the configuration space. Uh, so as the robot rotates, uh, the x, y location is fixed, uh, and so you're going up. Right, so the, the up dimension, the vertical dimension, is the orientation at theta. Here's a more complicated path. Uh, so here, x and y are changing, uh, and theta is, uh, is changing as well. And depending on which way, let me just play that again. Depending on which way the orientation is changing, you're either going up or, or down in the configuration space. So here, there's like one kind of point of the triangle that's fixed. Um, and the, the triangle's kind of rotating about that point. So x and y uh, are going in a circle. Uh, and theta is constantly increasing. Uh, and so the, the path that you get in configuration space is a helix. Right? So if you just looked at it from the top, you would see a, a circle. 
Um, but if you uh, take into account the change in uh, theta as well, uh, you get a, a helix. Yeah, I guess questions on those before we look at the optical ones. Let me just play the helix again. Sorry. Of rotations, the vertical direction. Yeah, I think the helix maybe is the, the clearest one to, uh, clearest like non-trivial one to, to visualize. So the next clip is gonna show the obstacles as well. Uh, and that's where things get more geometrically uh, complicated. Uh, even in this relatively simple scenario where everything is planar, uh, all the motion is, is in the, the plane, and the, the obstacles are just like two-dimensional obstacles. Um, so the portion that's kind of shaded in red on the left in the configuration space, uh, I think that's where uh, the robot is uh, not fully in collision. And then when it gets in collision, uh, that's kind of the, the middle portion, um, like over here. And then back here again, like the robot is not in collision, uh, but it's just like touching the uh, the edge uh, of the C uh, uh, set, the set of configurations where it is in collision. Yeah, here's another example. Uh, so the robot is just kind of on the, the boundary, right? So it's just always just like one point that's touching it, then at some point uh, it does go into the uh, C offset and then it comes out again. Yeah, so this is showing the, the full uh, C obs uh, for just one obstacle. Right? So there's only this one like polygonal obstacle on the on the right, uh, and this is the uh, the set of all configurations uh, that have the robot in collision with that obstacle. So I guess the goal here is not to get you to visualize necessarily like exactly why it looks like precisely like that, but just the point here is that it looks complicated, right? And like even constructing it uh, or like representing it, like how would you represent it? It's not convex, it's not a polygon, it's just like a complicated uh, kind of shape. Uh, like maybe you could uh, approximate it with a, a union of, of uh, polygons or unions, unions of like spheres or something, but it, it's not quite uh, natural. And here's the most interesting one. Um, this is a, a bunch of obstacles. It's not even that many, right? It's like five or something. Uh, but the, uh, the set of configurations, uh, like the C offset, uh, yeah, it's, it's like very, very complicated. All right, yeah, I guess questions on, on this? Uh, so you can imagine now doing this for like an N-link arm, right? Uh, so this was just a three-dimensional configuration space. If you have a 10-dimensional configuration space, uh, obviously these sets are gonna be even more complicated and hard to represent. Uh, and if we discretize that space, uh, solve a graph search problem uh, on that discretized space, that's going to be a, just a gigantic uh, mess uh, computationally. Okay, so yeah, I guess what's the uh, or questions on this? Go ahead. I think I'm just confused. Why was it coming back through the bottom? Was that just for the sake of the video, or mathematically would it like please restart? Yeah. So here, because the the y sorry the the z dimension, uh, the vertical dimension is the orientation. Uh, so the robot goes, um, yeah, actually, I guess the question is whether, let me see. So where was it that was, it was going back? It was clear on the second one, where it was triangular. Or even, not really that one, the one before. Oh, the one before, okay. Yeah. Like right here. With this one? Yeah. Um, so why does it go, oh, why does it go back up, uh, or go from up to, to down? Uh, so I think the top point is like 2 pi, and then the, the bottom point is, is 0. Uh, and so those are the, the same uh, configuration. Um, so 
yeah, if you want to go, uh, so let's say we're going from zero, like to 30 degrees, like so on, uh, like up to like 360 degrees, and then you wanted to go beyond, uh, then yeah, you're kind of like going up, and then you can say you're going back down again, which is the, the same point, uh, and then up again. Uh, so that, yeah, that's how it's being visualized. Yep. Good, other questions? All right. So yeah, I guess what's the, the solution? So like I said, conceptually, um, things are nice, right? We can, uh, like mathematically, like define these sets, we can say that we're gonna do some uh, planning on the, the configuration space, but actually doing it computationally uh, is, uh, is challenging. Uh, so that's where this algorithm called the, the Rapidly Exploring Randomized Tree, RRT algorithm, uh, comes in. So this is one of the, the most uh, popular uh, algorithms or variants of this basic algorithm that I'll describe today. Uh, are like among the, the most popular uh, motion planning algorithms uh, for doing motion planning in uh, continuous spaces for pretty complicated uh, systems. Um, so RRTs essentially get around both of these uh, challenges. Uh, so definitely the, the challenge of uh, representing the configuration space uh, and to some degree uh, the dimensionality uh, challenge as well. Um, so just as a kind of historical note, they were introduced around uh, the year 2000, so a little more than 20 years ago, uh, and they became popular like very, very quickly. Uh, so within just a, a few years, uh, people were using it for uh, all sorts of different uh, motion planning problems. Um, and part of the appeal uh, is that they're very simple to implement, uh, I guess as you'll see in the, the next uh, homework assignment. Um, yeah, they're, they're like relatively straightforward to uh, like implement and kind of understand in terms of uh, the algorithmic uh, procedure, uh, and they get around the, the technical challenges uh, with the approach I was describing, where you uh, discretize your uh, configuration space. Um, just one uh, note, I guess, is that uh, what I'm going to describe here today is the the most like basic version, so kind of the vanilla like version of the RRT. Uh, there are, I think, probably hundreds of of different variants of uh, RRTs. Uh, so when I was a grad student, uh, like at that time when you went to conferences, uh, there were like whole sessions on like RRT, like blah, like RRT this, RRT that, uh, just like hundreds and hundreds of uh, variants of, uh, of RRTs. Um, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about some of the, the important variants, uh, but at least for now, we're gonna focus on uh, the most kind of basic uh, vanilla uh, variant of the, the RRT. Okay. Um, and just, I guess, one final point. Um, so unlike the algorithms that we've uh, described so far, which are these graph search algorithms, uh, RRTs uh, operate kind of directly in the continuous space. Uh, so they don't discretize, at least initially. So there's some kind of discretization that happens. Uh, but at least initially, uh, you can think of the motion planning algorithm operating in the continuous uh, configuration space. Okay. So I guess just as a reference, if you're interested, I'll write it down here. Uh, so chapter 5.5 uh, in the, uh, the Planning Algorithms book uh, by Steve Laval. So Steve Laval is actually the, like one of the, the creators of the RT algorithm. He's also the, the one who wrote the uh, Planning Algorithms uh, book. So if you're interested in learning more, I guess look at chapter 5.5 of, uh, of his book. OK, so I'm going to go through the steps of the RT algorithm. Uh, pictorially, and then I'll write down the, uh, the algorithm a bit more uh, formally. Uh, so the setup here is that you have two obstacles. Uh, those are the, the sets that are uh, shaded in red. Uh, you have a starting configuration, uh, which I'm going to call Q subscript A, uh, and a goal configuration, uh, Q subscript uh, B. Um, so you should really think about this um, like visualization as corresponding to uh, configuration space. Um, I guess for the sake of visualization, I'm going to describe the algorithm for a point robot uh, that's, um, that's trying to like, navigate through the space. Uh, but in your head, you should think about uh, configuration space. And I'll make that connection a, a bit more precise once we understand the, the basic structure of the, the algorithm. OK. So the first iteration of the algorithm, the first step in the algorithm, uh, you just sample some random configuration. Um, so ignoring the obstacles, just some random configuration. Uh, so we're going to call that uh, Q subscript uh, rand, R-A-N-D, random. Um, you then look at the line segment 
uh, that connects uh, QA, the starting configuration, uh, to QRAND. Uh, so this is the line segment again in configuration space. Um, and then you extend along this line segment. So you start from QA, uh, you extend by some like parameter D that let's say is just like fixed. So this is a step size that we're going to fix uh, before like running the algorithm. Um, you then check whether QS is in uh, collision or not. Uh, so when you do this extension, uh, that extended point we're going to call QS. Uh, we're going to check whether it's in collision or not. Uh, if it's in collision, we're going to throw it away. Um, and then we're going to kind of repeat. Uh, if it's not in collision, so that, that's how it is in the pictures, it's not in, in collision with any of the obstacles, um, then you keep that extended point. Um, and so what we're going to do is basically incrementally, like iteratively, uh, build a tree. Uh, so a particular kind of graph that doesn't have any, any cycles. Um, so right now we've just built a tree that has two vertices, so QA and QS, uh, and an edge that connects uh, like those two vertices. Question? Do we check whether the point QS is in collision or the path? Okay, good. So for now, uh, let's just say that we're checking that the point uh, QS is in collision. Uh, but you're absolutely correct. What we really should be doing, I'll say a bit more about that later. Uh, what we really should be doing is uh, checking whether that whole line segment is in uh, collision or, or not. Uh, but just, yeah, for simplicity, uh, imagine that we're checking just, just whether QS is in collision. Question? Okay, so I think I just, how did you sure. change QRAM to QS? Yes, yeah, definitely. I'll, let me just go through it again. I'll, I'll go through a few more iterations so it, it should become clearer. But yeah, QRAM is just some random configuration. Um, and I guess by random, I mean you've picked some probability distribution. Here you can just think of like uniformly random over the space corresponding to the, the slide. Um, so you look at the line segment that connects uh, QA to QRAM, um, and then you just extend along that line segment by some uh, distance uh, that we're calling D. That distance is just some like fixed parameter in our algorithm. Um, and so that, that's, that's how we got the QS question. So QRAM could be in an obstacle. QRAM could be in an obstacle, yeah. Uh, so we're not going to check whether QRAM is in an obstacle or not. Uh, the thing we're checking is whether QS, like once we do the extension, uh, whether that is in an obstacle or, or not. OK, so yeah, I guess let's look at some, uh, some more iterations. So we repeat this process. So this is iteration two of the algorithm. Uh, again, we sample some random configuration, uh, ignoring the obstacles. Again, we look at the line segment, uh, except what we're going to do now is we're going to look at uh, the point in our existing graph, which right now just has these two, uh, two points. Um, we're going to look at the closest point, uh, closest to QRAM. Um, so right now, it's like this uh, vertex uh, over there. That's the, the closest to, to QRAM. So we're going to call that uh, closest point Q near. We're going to look at the line segment again that connects uh, Q near uh, to Q rand, and then we're going to extend by that same like parameter uh, d, uh, and that extended point we're going to call Q s. Uh, question. Um, is Q a relative to rand or relative? Sorry, say one more time. Is Q near like, closest to Q rand? Uh, closest to uh, Q rand. Yeah, yeah. So we're uh, sampling this uh, random configuration. We're going to look at the, the closest point in our existing tree to that random configuration. We look at the line segment that connects this Q near the closest point to Q rand. We do this extension operation. Uh, again, we check whether QS, like this extended point, is in collision or not. Uh, if it's not in collision, we add that to our graph. We add that to our tree. Uh, so that's, that's where we are at the end of the second iteration. A question? Yes, go ahead. Um, so are we, we are not looking at the configuration space yet, right? This is just a bracket already created space. Like so the for the purpose of drawing pictures, I'm kind of visualizing everything in, in uh, Euclidean space. Uh, but um, yeah, like really, you should think of this as corresponding to the, uh, the configuration space. Uh, there's one thing I haven't kind of discussed uh, in much detail yet, which is how do we do the collision checking, right? So. Um, yeah, if everything is kind of planar like this, we can just check whether a point is in collision with any of these. So yeah, there's a, there's a collision checking kind of problem that needs to happen, which is 
uh, like QS, like define some uh, configuration of the robot, we need to check whether that configuration uh, is, in a, is in collision or not. I'll, I'll say a bit more about that. Uh, but yeah, I guess first let's, let's just understand the, the kind of basic mechanism of the, of the algorithm, and I'll discuss some of the implementation details in a, uh, in a few slides. Okay, so this is the end of iteration two. Um, this is what we have. So we now have three vertices in our graph, three vertices in our tree, uh, and two edges. So we do this again. So we sample a, a random configuration. We look at the nearest point to that random configuration in our existing tree. Uh, we call that Q near. We look at the line segment that connects uh, Q near to Q round. We do this extension. Uh, at this iteration, QS is in collision. Uh, so we're just going to throw it away. Uh, so we're not going to do anything. We're going to revert back to the, uh, the tree that we have had before this iteration. Questions on, on that step? OK. So let me just do a few more. So another Q rand, random configuration, look at the nearest point, extend, uh, not in collision. So we're going to keep that. Uh, like I said, Q rand could be in collision, where we're just ignoring the obstacles when we're randomly sampling uh, configuration. Sorry. Did you this? No, no, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Yes. If you just went back a bit before yes. you choose Q near. Yeah. So when you chose that Q rand, is it if the second one were closer to Q rand, would that have been like the Q near? Because they kind of yes. Okay. Yeah. So maybe the way I've drawn the picture. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit tight. Uh, so <laughs> I, I think this. I think that the one I call Q near is actually the nearest one, uh, but I was just like eyeballing it. So it could be, yeah, it could be that, uh, like whatever is actually the, the nearest one. Uh, even you call Q8? It. Uh, even Q8, okay. yeah, even Q8, yeah. So anything in our existing tree, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think I might have an example um, in a bit. Okay, here it is. Uh, so this is a, a new Q rand. Um, so now the, the closest point is the one like over here. Uh, so that's the one we're going to call uh, Q near. And then we extend again, uh, check whether it's in collision, and add that to our tree. Question? How is uh, QS chosen? Why not just pick a Q rand and then go directly to that? Um, so, like, take a, I guess that would be a potentially really large uh, step, right? Um, so, what is happening here is that Q rand, uh, in a sense, is just helping us pick like a direction to explore in. Uh, and then we're exploring from the closest point on the tree, like in that general uh, direction. Um, but we're keeping the amount by which we're growing the tree uh, to be small. Uh, like otherwise, we'd be having like a really large, uh, like steps that we were taking, and the, the path would uh, like end up looking, yeah, like a little bit of a, a jumble, and you might not even like find a, a feasible like motion point. Okay, so QS is constant. Yeah. Uh, Q, well, the distance. That we're doing the extension by is constant here. Yeah. So far, in, in the way I've described it, yes, yeah. in this like vanilla version. Okay, let me see if I had more. Uh, okay, that, that's all the iterations I wanted to uh, discuss. Go ahead. So, what if your Q rand point is like very close, like a distance less than eight from like your points that already exist? Ah, yeah, good question. Um, in that case, uh, the way I'm describing it here, you would still extend by a distance of d. Uh, so you would kind of extend like beyond. Uh, like beyond that point. Yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah. Go ahead. Like, what if you extend and the point that is D away is not in that area, which isn't going to collide with anything, but like the line? Yes. Is yeah, I'll, I'll come to that in just a, in just a second. Yeah. Uh, so this was the, the same question as, uh, as before. Um, but I guess maybe I can just preview it. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll do it in a bit. I have it, I have it explicitly on the, the slides in a bit. Uh, so let me just go through the, the algorithm like written out uh, explicitly. Um, I guess maybe questions on the, the steps of the, the algorithm. Other questions? Um, all right, so the, the first step is you initialize your graph, which is really going to be a, a tree, uh, with just one vertex. That's the, the starting vertex, uh, the starting like, configuration. Uh, and then you do this kind of while loop uh, until you get close to the goal. Uh, so you're not going to sample, or you're not going to hit the goal exactly, uh, because we're just sampling like random like configurations. Uh, but at some point, we're going to grow the tree uh, enough such that there's some point on the tree uh, that uh, is like close enough by some threshold to the goal uh, configuration. Um, so yeah, the, the steps are kind of what I described. So Q rand is a random sample 
uh, configuration. Um, so just some point in configuration space. Uh, Q near is the vertex uh, in your existing tree. That's the, the closest to QRAND. Uh, we have this extension uh, operation uh, where we look at the line segment that connects uh, Q near to QRAND uh, and extend along that line segment. Uh, if QS is in collision, then you just throw that out. If it is not in collision, then you add that to that vertex, to your vertex, set to your tree, uh, and then you keep going until you get close to the, um, the goal uh, configuration. Um, so here's a visualization of what it looks like, uh, RT, uh, just kind of exploring without any obstacles. Uh, so if you just grew the tree on its own uh, without thinking about any obstacles, um, so people have kind of theoretically like studied uh, what RTs do, uh, and there's like tons of papers on this. Uh, they kind of have this like space filling uh, type property. Um, so right at the beginning, you see that they like that it explores in a whole bunch of different directions, uh, and then it starts getting more uh, like detail, right? Like it starts filling filling the gaps, um, and you can kind of formally uh, like prove that it uh, does that with like high uh, probability, like it covers like open regions in your configuration space, uh, and then it uh, like covers some of the, the kind of uh, smaller uh, like open open regions. But of course, this is sorry. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, like is this the like is this like the like the same form RT that we talked about? Because it seems like it's exploring like this like different parts of the space like simultaneously. So like. In our example, it seems like we're exploring like, one at a time, but was that just like one branch and we have many branches? Or is um, let me see. So I think the visualization is happening kind of quickly here. Uh, so that it might, it, yeah, I think it looks like it's uh, doing a bunch of explorations simultaneously, uh, but I think that's just because like each iteration is happening like quite quickly in the, the video. Uh, but it is the, the same like version uh, that I described. Uh, I think the reason it looks like it's exploring in different directions like simultaneously is just because of um, like where the QRAND is getting sampled uh, and then based on what the closest point is, that's the direction you're going to explore in. Uh, and yeah, I guess if you just do that quickly enough, like it looks like it's exploring in, in uh, lots of different uh, directions. Question? Yeah, so basically, I was going to, so if we, we already know what QB is, right? Like we know the end goal. Yes. So what happens if Q rand happens to be QB? Like we'd be like, oh, okay, and then it makes a straight line and you just keep increasing that way, or will it still sample a random one, which is another direction, which makes it inefficient? Um, so right now, the way I describe the algorithm, QS would have to be uh, close to the QB, like the goal configuration, uh, for you to terminate uh, the algorithm. Um, yeah, like I said, there's like many different variants. So like one modification you could make is uh, you could check whether the line segment between like Q near and Q rand is like fully uh, kind of not in collision. And if Q rand is close to the goal, then you can just say I'm done. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that that's definitely one uh, like modification you could make. Uh, here's a more kind of interesting example. So this is the RT like actually exploring in a space with obstacles. And you can see it found a path like pretty quickly. So it's the, the red uh, curve over there. We just play that again. Yeah. So it's just within a few iterations, like it finds a, a path from the start to the, the goal. Uh, all right. So now, yes, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, so this is one of the uh, the modifications you could make. Um, I think the step size. I think it was definitely noticeable more on the previous one. That, that was a black and white. Mm -hmm. Oh, on this one? Mm -hmm. Like, you can tell it starts with really large step sizes. Mm -hmm. and then ah, okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
like change somehow with, uh, with iteration. So initially you want to take larger steps. Uh, later on you want to take uh, smaller steps. Um, you could, yeah, there's like many different uh, like ways of like playing around with the, the step size parameter. Uh, and yeah, going back to, to your, uh, well, I guess two people asked this question. Um, so we ignored the fact that points along uh, the line segment that connects Q near to QS uh, could be in collision. So you could have a, a case where uh, both Q near and QS are not in collision. Uh, but if you look at the line segment, there's some point uh, that, that takes you in collision. Uh, so really what we should be doing is checking that the entire uh, line segment is uh, collision free. Um, so I guess a simple way to do this is you can just like discretize the line segment and do a whole bunch of points uh, and check that those are all uh, not in collision. Um, in certain cases you can really like fully check uh, whether the entire line segment is in collision or not. Uh, and you'll see that in the, the next uh, assignment when you implement the RRT we kind of do the, the good version, the correct version, where we check uh, that the entire line segment is, is not in collision, not just whether QS is in collision or not. Um, all right, so I guess here's the, the point I really want to, to emphasize. Um, this is the, the reason like RTs work so well. Um, so RTs don't require an explicit construction or description of the CObs set, so the obstacle uh, set in, in configuration space. Uh, if you think about the steps in the algorithm, uh, all we need to do, so the most kind of fundamental operation, the most basic operation, uh, is we need to check whether the robot is in collision uh, at some particular configuration, right? So we're sampling this QRAN, we're generating this QS, uh, and then we're saying, okay, like at this QS, uh, is the robot in collision uh, or not? Um, and it turns out that that problem, like if I give you a specific uh, configuration for the robot, uh, and the obstacles are in, in some specific, uh, like have some specific geometry and, and locations, uh, then you can do that collision checking uh, very efficiently. Uh, actually, a lot of the algorithms uh, for collision checking, uh, like efficient collision checking, came from the video game industry. Uh, so yeah, you can imagine, I guess, lots and lots of video games um, like have uh, like points for like not colliding with obstacles, like uh, penalties for colliding with, with things. Uh, so a lot of like effort went into really fast uh, collision checking for video games. Even simulating some of the physics uh, of video games requires uh, like collision checking. Um, so there's lots of software and lots of like really clever algorithms uh, that work really efficiently uh, for doing uh, collision checking for a specific like configuration of the robot and specific configuration of the obstacles, which is precisely what the RT needs. So we're not coming up with some like explicit like polygonal or, or uh, like some other construction uh, of uh, C-OBS, right? We're never representing that set uh, explicitly. Uh, we're just relying on this ability to do collision checking. Question? Yeah, so just to get a bit of intuition on this, yes. is the reason why this is a lot easier than like constructing like explicitly the C-OBS is that we are, we are just, we, we are <coughs> with just having the Euclidean representation of the deletion, like of the object, of the obstacles. And then when we are like exploring like a, a new point in the configuration space, we only need to transform that point into the Euclidean space. Yeah, and, it's, and then see whether it is in one of the obstacles. Yeah, so the reason this is simpler is because it's just one point, like one specific configuration. Uh, whereas with COPs, you're thinking about all the configurations that result in a collision, and that's a much more like complicated uh, like set. Yeah, I guess other questions on, on that point. I think that that's the main like thing I really want to. Uh, uh, here's a video that maybe illustrates that. So we're back to the piano movers problem. Uh, so someone implemented uh, the RT uh, for literally moving a, a piano in this apartment. Um, and I think this is showing the kind of like steps in the RRT algorithm. Um, so for our visualization purposes before, I was just drawing like points and everything was like planar. Um, here, like actual like configurations are being sampled, like configurations of the, the piano. Uh, are being sampled, and we're checking uh, whether things are in uh, collision or not, which again is something that uh, I guess you can take my word for, we can do uh, pretty uh, efficiently. Uh, and that's the, the path that it found uh, at the end. Um, so this is a, a path that gives you uh, configurations uh, that the piano must take uh, to get from some initial configuration to a final configuration uh, without colliding with, uh, with obstacles. Question? 
Sorry, I think this makes sense, but like just to confirm this, like other than it gives you like a feasible path, but not necessarily like the. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So this is just doing feasible uh, motion planning. Uh, I'll mention a version uh, that does uh, some kind of like optimal planning as well, but uh, this one is just giving you a, a feasible path. Uh, and we'll see actually that the feasible paths can be like very weird and, and like uh, very far from any notion of like optimality. Um, yeah, let me show you what I guess one can do with, uh, with RRTs. So this is a, a group at MIT, Nick Rice group, uh, that we're using uh, RRTs uh, for doing motion planning uh, for a drone. Uh, in these like indoor environments, so this is the, the path that RT found. Uh, it's actually yeah some variant of uh, of RT, uh, and then you'll see the, the drone actually uh, executing that uh, trajectory. Uh, and these are like pretty cluttered uh, spaces, right? So you can imagine that the geometry of the drone. Uh, really does uh, matter. And I guess I'll, I'll emphasize again, there's an assumption here, which is that the Obstacle locations are known, right? So we haven't come to the version yet where obstacle locations are unknown, uh, but still, this is like pretty, pretty impressive. If I gave you, uh, if I told you where the obstacles are, uh, the RT algorithm finds a feasible plan, uh, and you can then uh, get your robot to, to execute it. Um, and yeah, just a, a couple more details so we can get back the actual like path uh, from A to B by keeping track of like parents as you grow the, the tree. So it's the exact same process as. Uh, like BFS, DFS, uh, Dijkstra, and A star. Uh, and yeah, there's a question about optimality. Um, so the, the paths that you get from RT uh, can be pretty uh, jagged because you're kind of randomly sampling directions. You're uh, like growing the, the tree in these, in these different directions. Um, so here's an example. Uh, this is a PR2 uh, kind of like humanoid robot. Uh, and I think the, the motion planning problem here is just get the arms uh, to something that is close to grasping the, the mug uh, that's on the, the table. Uh, and I guess on the table is also the planning algorithms uh, book. <laughs> so this is what it does. <laughs> All right, so it's definitely feasible, right? Like it got there eventually, uh, but it's not, yeah, it's not really optimal. <laughs> Um, so, yes, question. So for that problem you described, can you just look at the jagged edges and try to like zoom in? Yes, yeah, uh, and, and that's, that's something uh, you can definitely do. So you, you find a, just a rough plan with, a, with an RT, uh, and then maybe you fit like a spline or, or something, some other kind of like smoothing uh, to, to smooth it out. Uh, there's a different algorithm, like a different variant of the RRT. Um, well, like I said, there's many variants, probably like hundreds of variants. Um, but one of the uh, like really important uh, variants, maybe the one you would want to use in, in practice, uh, is called RRT star. Um, so it's kind of analogous to A star, like optimal. Um, so RRT star returns uh, approximately optimal paths. Um, so in contrast to the standard version of the RRT that I described, uh, that just gives you a, a feasible uh, path. Uh, and nowadays, there's uh, like really good software libraries for implementing uh, many of these uh, algorithms, uh, so I think OMPL, like the o Open Motion Planning uh, Library, uh, has implementations of, uh, of RRT star. Uh, so if you're using it beyond, I mean, in this course you should implement it yourself, make sure you understand it, but beyond this course if you're interested in uh, using RRTs or RRT star, uh, that's uh, something that I would uh, recommend looking into. Uh, so it's approximately optimal, approximately because all of these algorithms uh, have some like, random component. And I guess as you uh, take more and more iterations, uh, you get something that gets uh, closer and closer to optimal uh, mm -hmm. under certain uh, assumptions. Uh, another important variant is what's known as the bi-directional RRT. Uh, so in the version of the RRT algorithm that I described, you're kind of growing the tree from the starting configuration. Uh, but you could imagine growing like two trees, like one from the starting configuration, another from the, the goal configuration, 
uh, and then terminating when like they connect uh, somehow. Uh, this is just to give you a flavor of like different possibilities, like some of the different variants that you can have uh, with uh, with RTs. Okay, so RT star. So this is back to our uh, like this PR2 uh, planning problem. That's what RT star does. I think this video is actually from the uh, the original uh, like paper on RT star. So it does kind of what you expect. Uh, and just gets to the, the goal. And yeah, here's the comparison of RT with RT star on the two dimensional planning problem. Uh, and you can see that it, RT star is slowly kind of refining its path uh, to get more and more optimal. I think here the optimality criterion is just uh, distance. You want to find the shortest length path uh, from start to goal. Uh, and yeah, RT is not giving you something that's uh, optimal, obviously. And then here's the side-by-side -side comparison of the planning problem for the PR2. So RT star just goes kind of directly. RT does this like random like dance uh, thing, <laughs> <laughs> but gets there eventually, which is which is good. Uh, questions on this? Go ahead. Um, is it like will the right? Is it possible like the right hand gets there much after like the left hand gets there and the RT? Um. So it depends on exactly how you, uh, yeah, I guess how you set up the, the problem. So uh, if you ignore, uh, if you just say that I want like both hands to be like close to uh, the mug, so it could be that, yeah, the like one hand gets it gets there quickly, the other hand uh, does not. That's definitely like a feasible plan, uh, and it's something RT could find. Uh, other questions? Yes. For RT star, why was it exploring like all the spaces after it found a path? Because it kind of seems like after you find like a path, you would want to just refine the path instead of trying to find other. Yeah, paths. so not necessarily, right? I guess that could be like multiple ways. So if you're going like around an obstacle, um, so if there's like kind of like two qualitatively like different ways of, of getting to the goal. So one like left around an obstacle, one right around an obstacle. Uh, but maybe like one is just slightly better, so maybe going left around the obstacle uh, is slightly shorter. Uh, maybe there's like a slight like asymmetry in where the obstacle is placed. Uh, in that case, because of the randomness of the algorithm, you might find uh, a path that goes right around the obstacle. Uh, but then later on, you might find another thing that kind of goes the other way, and then you refine that like instead. Um, so yeah, that, that's the reason you keep like searching uh, like as the, the algorithm uh, like iterates. Yeah. All right. So I guess the last thing I want to uh, talk about, I think we just have yeah, five more minutes, uh, is this notion of completeness, which is really central uh, to uh, motion planning. And it's something that people have thought about for uh, decades in the motion planning literature. Uh, so here's a concrete question. So suppose there exists some path from the initial configuration A uh, to the, the final configuration B. Uh, will an RRT find it? Uh, so is it like guaranteed to uh, find it? Um, I guess what's the so let me just define this notion and then and then we can discuss it. So uh, this thing is called completeness. Uh, so a planning algorithm is complete uh, if it finds a, a path from start to goal uh, and does so in some like finite like amount of time. Uh, and if the, the path doesn't exist, then the algorithm like terminates in some uh, finite amount of time and, and returns failure and like tells you there's no way to get from start to, to goal uh, as opposed to just running uh, forever. Uh, so I guess, what do you think? So with the RRT, is it complete or, or not? Wait, can RRT uh, keep choosing? Like, whenever it chooses QRAM, can it choose stuff that's already chosen? Or that's already So because QRAND is chosen, uh, let's say, like uniformly, randomly, uh, you're not going to sample something that's exactly uh, something you sampled before. Um, uh, right, so that has like the zero like probability of like exactly sampling. You might something you might sample something that's like close, uh, but not not exactly the, the same. Yeah. Yeah, I guess what do people think is is the RT algorithm complete or go ahead? Wouldn't it not be able to find a path if it doesn't exist like that? It doesn't exist because it would run forever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's gonna keep it's gonna keep trying, right? And it's not gonna know. And that it uh, that it hasn't uh, that that doesn't exist uh, a path. Um, so the discrete search algorithms that we uh, described in the past two lectures, so BFS, DFS, star, A star, uh, those are complete, and you can prove that. 
complete for the discrete version of the problem, for the graph search problem, they're complete. So if there's a path, they'll tell you in a finite amount of time and find it. Uh, if there isn't one, it'll terminate in a finite amount of time and tell you there's no path. Uh, but yeah, RTs are, are not complete, so they may, like you said, run forever uh, if there's no path from start to goal. Uh, there's a different notion of completeness, which goes by the name of probabilistic uh, completeness, uh, which says that if a path exists from start to goal, uh, then the probability uh, that the RT algorithm finds that path uh, converges to 1 uh, as the number of iterations uh, increases. Um, so as you like iterate through the algorithm, the RT algorithm, uh, the probability that you find a path, if one exists, uh, that probability converges to, uh, to one. Um, this is under some technical conditions. So I haven't stated what the conditions are. Uh, but under some conditions, which you'll get to explore uh, in the, the assignment, uh, the next assignment where, the, where you'll uh, think about the RT, uh, under, those, under some assumptions, uh, you can prove probabilistic completeness. Uh, so it's not always the case that the RT is probabilistically complete, uh, but if you make some kind of relatively uh, mild assumptions, these are assumptions that have to do with uh, like separation of uh, obstacles. Uh, if you make those assumptions, then you can prove that the RT is probabilistically uh, complete. All right, questions on on this? Yeah, go ahead. So why is RT not complete? Uh, so RT was not complete because uh, if there's no path. Uh, it might just run forever, right? So it's not gonna like terminate uh, in a I finite amount of time. I thought if there was a path um, and it finds it, then it's completely No, it's it's both of these conditions. So uh, planning algorithm is complete if it finds a path uh, from start to goal if it exists, and also if it doesn't exist, uh, then it terminates in a finite amount of time. Okay, good. I'll see you uh, next week.